in and let's get started. Um, so if you are joining us and, um, and didn't get a chance to uh, hear Nicole Whiteman and Neka Gulmake speak as keynote speakers, um, this event uh, will be recorded and we will send out the recording and it's also being live streamed on YouTube. Um, but great way to start things off to really powerful women um, intelligent and, and really doing some powerful things. So thank you both. Um, we're going to keep it rolling and uh, let's introduce um, the next panelists. So uh, again, thank you, Nicole and Neka for, for rejoining us for this session. Unfortunately, we won't have Pam Schreiber, who is an ESPN analyst um, who was slated to join us, but some things came up and, and she's not able to join. And so we wish her the best um, and hope that she can certainly join us for another event in the future. Um, but let's start it off. So we've got Dr. Kiki Baker Barnes, Director of Athletics at Dillard University. She's the past president of the NAIA Athletic Directors Association Board of Directors and also serves as a member for the Greater New Orleans Sport Foundation and the Minority Opportunities Athletic Association. She's a trailblazer as well as she is the first female and first African-American president of the Gulf Course Atlantic Conference and is the first African-American female commissioner in the NAIA. She has been recipient of many awards, including the industry's highest award, the Under Armour Athletic Director of the Year Award in 2019, and the prestigious um, Administrator of the Year Award presented by the Women and Leaders in College Sports in 2015. In 2018, the New Orleans Pelicans honored her for her work in the community. She is the founder of So You Want a Career in Athletics, a professional leadership development program designed and introduced to introduce girls ages 13 to 18 to career opportunities in sport. So welcome, Dr. Barnes. Um, we have Sally Namani. She uh, began her career in the sports industry as an up-to-us sports coach, coaching young girls across New York City. Her experiences as a former athlete and coach, coupled with working in the sport for good industry nationally, internationally, in various capacities has given her a well-rounded view of the power of sport to build community and influence in the lives of young people. She is involved in several local and international leadership groups advancing opportunities for women and girls in sports. Sally is currently the U.S. Director of Programs and Partnerships at Peace Players International. She is driven by building community for a cause through sport and grounded in partnerships with diverse stakeholders. She is particularly driven um, by promoting equity through sports, philanthropy, social responsibility, and creating real opportunities to level the playing field for young people to access high quality sport experiences. Thank you. We have Alicia Powell. Um, after graduating from New York Law School, where she held many leadership positions and focused her studies on sports law, Alicia started her own nonprofit and business consult consulting firm. She is the founder of Champions for Philanthropy, a consulting agency that assists professional athletes, entertainers, and influencers develop their charitable brands. As co-founder and CEO, um, Alicia helps athletes establish their nonprofit foundations, manage existing foundations, design charitable um, initiatives and programs, as well as create their charitable vehicles for giving back. With a propensity for community activism, Alicia has served on multiple nonprofit boards throughout her career. Welcome, Alicia. Okay. So let's dive in. Let's dive in. I didn't forget anybody, did I? Okay. All right. Um, so I want to first start off and say that um, we asked for girls to participate in this. We asked them, we would, we would like to, and we will have in later sessions some uh, youth moderators that will be joining us and helping to moderate these sessions. Um, but what we did do was we asked girls to submit some questions um, that they would like to ask you. Um, and so that's sort of what's gonna guide our conversation today. Um, are these questions from, from young people who want to know how you got where you are, what they need to do, 
um, and, and just really some, some key points into how they can, they can be um, in your seat, all right? So let's start off with this question and then we'll just have some discussion around it. Um, so one youth wanted to know, how often do you feel you're being dis disrespected in the workplace because you're a woman? Great question. Um, let's start with you, Alicia. Let's start with you. So my situation is a little bit different because I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, so my co-founder is a woman as well. Uh, so we really set the tone for the organization in terms of uh, that we won't be disrespected uh, because it's our company. Um, however, when we are out in the world, things are a lot different, uh, right? Because as an entrepreneur, we're constantly dealing with uh, outside individuals uh, and it comes up, you know, it is uh, just in general, women can be disrespected. Um, as you may see, I'm a woman of color. So that adds another layer of disrespect that often comes up. Uh, and then being in the sports industry that is both male dominated and dominated by people who don't look like me, uh, disrespect comes. However, I have also um, dealt with a lot of respect where um, whether it's the education or the work ethic, uh, people uh, respect me for the work product that I put out uh, and the fact that I respect them. So I just work on giving respect whenever I can. I like that. That does, that does add a, a different dynamic to it. When you are um, creating your own and doing your own thing, um, there's a different level of, of how you um, move throughout the world as, as a leader. Um, and so I, I definitely understand um, where you're coming from with that. But for those of you who are working um, for companies or institutions um, where that's not the case, um, Dr. Barnes, maybe you can jump in here. You're, you know, you're at a university where, um, you know, up until recently, you didn't see a whole lot of women in the athletic department at all. And now here you are as an athletic director. So how about you speak to that? Any times where you felt um, disrespected as a woman? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I have a very funny story about this. So, <laughs> so I'll tell you. So my very first, I, I took over as athletic director at Dilla University right after Hurricane Katrina. So in 2006, I had just turned 31. Um, I wasn't proven at that time. I'd only hit, been a head bit women's basketball coach. Um, so, you know, this was, it was a great opportunity to expand my skill set. But again, there was a lot I didn't know. So my very first meeting with the, at, with the conference, I was the only woman in the room. We're having a conversation. The gentleman who's leading um, the athletic director's meeting says, okay, we're going to get ready to call the order to the meeting. Um, we need somebody to take the minutes. Keep me, why don't you take the minutes? And so I was kind of like, well, why, why, why do I have to take the minutes? So uh, all the men around the table, but the only person that was qualified to take the minutes, you know, it was the woman. And it was so funny. I'll never forget, like, you could see some of the, my colleagues' responses, like, they started cringing, like, they knew like, ooh, that wasn't right. And I'll tell you what, they apologized to me at the end of that meeting. Like who, whoever was the president of the conference said, I just, I just want to offer an apology and just say, you know, we're going to work on, on those things and do a little bit better job. We didn't mean to be offensive. But I'll tell you, there were a couple of things that happened in that moment. And I remember sitting there thinking, like, how am I going to respond to this? Am I going to make a big deal about I'm the only woman in the room? Why, you know, am I going to do that? Or will I do what I need to do? So I remember thinking, you know what? I looked at him and I said, sure, I'll take the minutes. And all I could think was, yeah, because I'm going to be the next president and I want you to know how to do this for me when I'm in charge. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, Absolutely. I, so you know, I felt some kind of way, but let me tell you, um, one of the things that I, I feel like is more of an issue, maybe than just being a woman, and I don't want to, that, that's its own unique challenge, but confidence is a really big part for us and confidence is something that you need in order to earn respect and so mm -hmm. what i'll say is in my early journey as an athletic director and a leader it was more my personal lack of confidence and, and not quite being quite sure sometimes that i felt like that led to more of the challenging and the disrespect than it was in me being a woman 
And I'll tell you, as I started gaining more confidence, as I became more um, understanding of what I was doing and how I was leading, when I leaned into my own personality, the bubbliness that comes with me, this is what you're going to get, you know, when, when I step into the room. Um, I'm not a dictatorial person and, you know, you're going to do this. I am collaborative and there is power in that kind of leadership. When I stepped into that, I saw that people started to follow. So I think something that's really critical for our young girls, and which is what I love so much about Up To Us Sports, about girls on the run and organizations like this, is that we're working on the thing that they will need, and that's confidence. Thank you. I think that's that's an important point. And, and I don't know that, you know, so if we're looking at you, Dr. Barnes, and we see this confident woman, right? Um, and it just seems as though you've always been that way. Um, but I know that for most of us, no, we weren't always that way. So Sally, can you jump in here and, and just tell us, how do, you, how do we get to be a, a Dr. Barnes? How do we get to be a Sally Namani? Where do, how do we start to develop that type of confidence to say, you know what, I can be a leader, I can step out here, I can do these types of things. What do girls need to do, Sally? Yeah, so I, I will answer that question from the perspective of myself when I was younger, given that a young person asked um, this question. Um, so I remember even just growing up and playing sports or playing basketball, especially. Actually, I, I started off playing soccer and my brother and I would play at home. And but when, when we got to school, the boys played on the soccer pitch and I didn't even dare go over there because I knew I was not going to pick. And the game was also too rough and I didn't feel safe playing, playing soccer. And then fast forward when uh, my family moved to the U.S., I'm originally from Nigeria, and I picked up basketball. And um, I would go to the park, and it would be guys everywhere. It was a male-dominated space. Think like 13 through 17-year-old teenage boys. Like, that is a very intimidating space, right? And so the first few times when I first started going to play uh, basketball, I would never get picked. I would be on the sidelines. And also, I didn't feel all the way confident because I had just started playing. And then eventually, you know, I started going to the park with my older brother. And having my older brother there kind of helped me start to develop that, that confidence. And as I got better over the years, I started coming into my own voice, into my own person, that I can walk to that park and call for it, call next and play with the guys. And so growing up in that neighborhood where I was the only girl who really actively played sports or played basketball, I got very comfortable very young being in male-dominated spaces. And finding my voice in sports was a key factor for me and that it allowed me to develop my confidence both on the court and also um, off the court. Um, I had this just innate or natural belief in myself that having seen what my body is capable of, I know what I'm capable, capable of um, off the court as well, be it in the classroom or be it at work or be it anywhere else. Um, I won't be the person to brag in your face, but in, inside, inwardly, I know that um, I'm capable of whatever it is that's put in front of me. And that came from my, um, my background playing sports and just leaning into that uncomfortable time of not being picked or not being the most confident person or not being the most, the best person in the room. And so I think that also applies to young girls now, be it if you're playing sports or in the classroom or in, in wherever it is that it's okay to not be good when you're starting out. Um, and be willing to lean into the, that struggle of getting better and from developing your skill set or finding your voice, you will be able to strengthen your, your confidence. And so all young girls, uh, be it our young people and peace players or any person who, any young person who's watching uh, this summit today, I hope that you walk away with knowing that wherever it is that you are in your journey, be it a young person who's trying to come out of their shell, or who's growing up and finding their leadership voice, know that this will take you some time and it'll probably take you feeling very uncomfortable. It may take you having to be the one woman in a male domi dominated space. And so lean into that, there's power in it. Um, as I got older, I even embraced being a woman and a black woman. Um, I, I see it as my superpower. I don't care what anyone says that I'm a, I'm a woman and I'm black and this is what's gonna be my um, barrier. And yes, do those barriers exist? Of course they do. But in my mind, I see it as my superpower. And so if you can try to rewire that thinking um, and allow yourself to fail, allow yourself to kind of suck <laughs> at the start, and, and that will help you build your confidence as you get older. Sure. 
One of the things I think that, so I coach volleyball and, and, and coach girls from ages, you know, as young as eight um, up to 18. And one of the things that I found that's very difficult sometimes is that girls, um, and I think it's getting better, but especially in the United States, we socialize girls to be a certain way. Um, that we're, we're brought up to believe that we need to be nice and sweet and kind and, you know, speak when we're spoken to. And so that's sort of how society says that girls should operate um, and move throughout the world. Um, luckily, I did not grow up that way. I had parents who, uh, who thought that I need to go out there and do what I need to do and speak up and be heard and, and, and be noticed. Um, but not all girls are socialized that way. And so one of the things that I've done with some of my girls is we do this sort of alter ego um, activity where you look at a NECA, right, on a court and you say, I want to be that, like she's, she's dominating on the court. She's doing all of these spectacular things and that's wonderful, but I don't think I have that in me to do that. That's not my personality. So NECA, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this to you. Are you different on the court? Are you a different person? Do you show up differently on the court in your sport than you do in life? And at what points do you merge the two? Well, that's a great question. Um, I too am Nigerian and I was born and raised in Houston. And so I'm sure Sally can certainly attest to um, the culture of upbringing in Nigerian kids, most specifically uh, girls. And for me, I'm the oldest of four girls. And so being the oldest, I'm also the first grand, like granddaughter. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot on my shoulders when it comes to, you know, expectations and standards um, of which were kind of my own challenges to kind of sift through, especially in what um, our culture deems quite unconventional um, to enter in as far as kind of like a passion or a profession. And I'm realizing now as, as, as an athlete, in a lot of ways, how I am both on the court, how I am as the president of the Players Association, how I am as a teammate, um, a lot of my personality is coming out. What I didn't realize was in me is coming out. And so in a lot of ways too, um, how I play and how I am on the court or when I'm performing, I'm also discovering about myself. And I felt as though that was really the beauty in the sport. I'm very much, you know, as I said, I was raised Nigerian American and I'm very much, um, <laughs> I'm very much t collaborative. You know, growing up, you know, they always ask questions of you. Did you guys ever play against each other? And I'm just kind of like, that was never really a thing. That was never really an option. You played with each other, you encouraged each other, you backed each other up. And I learned that especially not just in my upbringing, but also in just how, just how girls are incorporated into sport. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not competitive with the exception of it being a sport. And I found so much strength in that, that I was able to discover how I could be as a teammate, how I could be as a sister, how I could be as a daughter through these um, seemingly innocuous challenges on the court that very much translated to my life off the court. And, uh, you know, my, my teammates joke around with me because I have like, my nickname is like Neckinator. And so like, that comes out, <laughs> but even if I feel as though I'm dominating on the court, there's still an aspect of my game that is still authentic to who I am. Like, I'm not a trash talker. I don't play dirty. Like, that's just not how I am. I'm very principled when it comes to justice, integrity, and such. And so even if I am playing against you, that's always gonna reign true for me. If you fall and you're not on my team, I'll still help you up. That doesn't mean I'm gonna let you score because like Sally said, I still know my superpower and the objective is to win the game. And so I think that um, 
being in sport, it's really kind of, it's exacerbated a lot about me, but it's also revealed so much about myself that I didn't know was already there. But to many on the outside looking in, it appears to be an evolution that they didn't expect or, um, you know, a lot of times people feel as though people don't necessarily change and the core of you may not, but there's so many beautiful things in struggle and challenges and empowerment that can re you can really discover about yourself that I feel like I'm finally coming into. Like I just turned 30 this year and I'm like, why did this take so long? <laughs> but <laughs> but um, it's, it's such a wonderful journey and to be able to be, to, to be able to experience what I've experienced up until now and constantly remind myself that I have, n I'm not going to, nor will I ever master this, whatever this is. No one can ever just be on their deathbed and be like, I figured it out. I did it. Like that's never going to happen. <laughs> I mean, it shouldn't. Some people might think that it does, but, um, that's what I'm realizing now as I evolve as a woman, as I evolve as a black woman, as an athlete, as a member of my community, as a citizen, you know, as someone that just wants to make a difference. And uh, it's, it's quite beautiful. And I think it's very important, especially as women, that we're very gentle with every part of ourselves, even the parts of ourselves that we don't necessarily know, the parts of ourselves that we don't like, because there's so much that can be found in those challenges that create the whole self that you love and that you're confident about and that you also help to empower other women as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, well, um, you're right, Mecca, you're 30 and you're like, why, what did it, why did it take this long? I'm about to be 50 and I'm still, I'm saying the same thing. Why did it, why did it take this long? Like I'm, I feel like, and I think it's an evolution. And I think all of you ladies will agree that it's an evolution to get through these stages in your life where you're like, okay, I think I've mastered that. Um, now it's time to move forward and do something else. And then you start to evolve again. And now, and now there's another area of your life that you feel like you want to master. And so, um, Nicole, I'm going to pull you in because I'm not really sure where you go from CEO of the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure what you, I know you're going to do more and continue to expand. But can you talk about did you see yourself doing this when you were playing soccer, when you were a youth playing your sport? Is this what you saw for yourself? The, the immediate answer is no, um, but I saw something like this for myself and I always knew that I would be doing something big and called to do something big. And I credit that to my parents 100%. Um, similarly, from a cultural perspective, I mentioned earlier, my parents are immigrants to this country from Jamaica and they came here because their, parents, their kids were gonna have a fantastic education and we were gonna be great. That was just what was instilled, right? You get an education, you go to college. Um, interestingly enough, till about two years ago, my dad, and this is an interesting story for the girls and the, the young women on this call, um, I had to have a conversation with him and say, you gotta stop telling people I'm going to law school. I'm over 40 years old. <laughs> I have, um, I, tr I once said I was going to be a political science major right before I entered Spelman. Um, and it's like over 20 years, dad, and that's not happening. And I'm having a wonderful career. And for him, it was, it was more of a misunderstanding of like, well, I can't really explain what you do. Like break this philanthropy thing down for me. It's not lawyer and it's not doctor. So I'm not, I'm just not really getting it. Well, I'm going to need you to be a lawyer so I can explain. But I, exactly. <laughs> but I just don't know what all that means. And now I think he's totally embraced it all. But um, interestingly enough, I, I say that, I tell that story to say that I always knew that I'd be doing something big um, because my parents were pushing me to do something big. And I was motivated by my siblings and my family and my upbringing. Um, it's interesting because I would, could have never told you that I would be holding this position as the CEO of the Dodgers Foundation, but I knew somewhere along the way that investment management wasn't for me. I knew that publishing was a training ground for me. And as I continued to seek what I was missing, it really was, wow, you want to give back to people the way in which you've been given. 
Um, I was a beneficiary of organizations, which is the reason I went to high school. I went to college. You know, my mentors and the individual women that came into my life that helped push me forward, all of these things were a true story of my success. Um, and the reality is for me is I was always being pushed to a platform where I could turn that back around and pay it forward. And I, I am blessed, obviously, that I have a, this platform that is this great global brand that is the Dodgers to do it on. Um, I'm blessed as a, a Black woman to be able to, to use this brand to change lives um, of a lot of young women and girls specifically who I think look like me, have similar upbringings to me have similar goals that they want to achieve. Um, so when you even ask, where do I go next, right? I continue to use my platform wherever I am um, to pay it forward. And I think you can do that in so many different ways. And that's ultimately um, what I'm doing every single day. I think that it's the combination of the brand and my voice and frankly, my personal story that I choose to tell over and over and over again, because I do think that there's so many different pieces in there um, that show women, you can be a first generation college graduate, daughter of immigrants um, who didn't know she was gonna be the CEO of the Dodgers Foundation when she was seven years old. I didn't know, but right now I'm blessed. And if I use this the right way, all I'll be doing is continuing to impact the lives of, of so many people um, using this platform. I like that. I think, you know, what I keep hearing from each of you um, is the impact that a parent, you know, has stepped in and what they've told you um, and what that voice sounds like and how that then resonates with the inside of you about what you say about yourself and how you say it. You know, all of that matters. Um, but Alicia, for girls who may be watching this um, and haven't figured it out, and may not have that parent, that mother, that father, who's, who's telling them that they can do whatever it is that they wanna do, um, and don't really know what that journey looks like for them. What do, you, what do you say to them? What do you say about, hey, listen, I am an entrepreneur, I started a business. How do they do that? How do, how do I go from, I don't know what I'm doing with my life to, I'm starting a business. That's what I want to do. Yeah, it's really important to listen to the voice within. Um, you know, we all have the voice, but sometimes we just don't listen. Uh, we let external factors cloud that voice. And sometimes our path takes us down what we think other people want for us or the voices that we're hearing. But you have to stay true to the voice that you hear on the inside. Um, so if you don't have, you know, anyone cheering you on or if you don't have anyone directing you, you have to say, um, I know what it is that I want, and I'm not going to let anything stop me from doing that. I think it's really important for young girls to realize that because, you know, whether it's the television or whether it's social media or whether it's their families, there are going to always be outside factors telling you that you can't do something, that you're too this, that you're too that, um, that you don't know enough, whatever it is. So you just have to know deep down that if you heard it, that it can be achieved. Um, when I was a little girl, I didn't know exactly what it is I wanted to be, but I had this vision in my mind. And I said, you know, it didn't matter what uh, everything around me looked like, or it didn't matter that I was a first generation college student. None of that mattered because I just knew that I was going to keep going um, and nothing was going to stop me, even when uh, other things came in, roadblocks came. Uh, you just have to have that vision and just keep going. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. I, you know, um, it's one of those things that you, if you listen to other people long enough, the positive stuff, not the negative stuff, <laughs> the positive stuff, um, and someone is consistently telling you, you know, you can do this, you can set your own path. Somehow that then translates into now that's my voice that I hear in my head as well. And now that propels me to do something different. And so I think having um, women such as yourselves constantly saying it, constantly saying it in platforms like this um, allows girls to then take that voice. I remember Alicia Powell said, um, and then letting it then become.
become their own voice. So I think that's a powerful, powerful thing for us to remember um, when dealing with young girls. Doc, um, I had a um, point. I, I wanted to actually comment on that. Um, I, I had parents who spoken to me and they would always encourage me, but I didn't believe them when I was six and seven. Mm -hmm. I thought that my mom told me those things just because she was my mom and she was supposed to. Um, when I was in the seventh, eighth grade, I had the opportunity to participate in what they call peer leadership camps. And so it was, it was something that they were doing in our parish. That would be county for everybody else in Louisiana's parishes. The rest of the world is county. So <laughs> in, our, in our parish, they selected uh, uh, students that they thought um, were leaders or potential leaders for this statewide peer leadership camp. I had an opportunity to go to that camp and I was about eighth grade. And I remember being at that camp and one of the counselors saw me and I smiled. And she told me that I had the most beautiful smile and that my smile was gonna change the world. And my mom used to tell me stuff like that and I didn't believe it. But it wasn't until I heard it from this person who didn't know me from anyone else and it's like, they saw the same, my mama told me that, but this lady just said the same thing. So what's really going on? And I, it's, it's, it's one thing that I'm 45 that I have never forgotten. Like I, I, I've never forgotten that moment. That was a life changing moment for me because it was almost like there was this affirmation of something that had been told over and over and again. And I was, well, I don't, I don't really know. And I wasn't getting that kind of affirmation from my peers because we want affirmation from our peers. We want, we want people to like us. You know, we want to connect and be cool. And I wasn't necessarily cool. I was just a weird person that's always excited about everything. <laughs> and just always extra hyper. And, and nobody knew what to do with that at the time. But when she told me that, it's like I owned it from that point forward. And I decided like, okay, this is who I am. And I'm going to be that person, whether people like me or not. I like me. And I think when I was able to step into that space and understand that me liking me mattered more than anything else, that is when I got affirmation from peers and other people were able to accept me. So I think it's really important for you young ladies who are listening, you have to be happy with who you are. And when you can be comfortable it makes it a lot easier to connect and develop those relationships and start to have success in your life. So true, so true. I'm gonna, I wanna open it up and you guys can take your mics off and, and let's just have a conversation. But um, Sally, I wanna, I wanna ask you this because you were an up to us sports coach and, and you did that for a while. But I wanna ask you, how intentional were you when you coached girls, how intentional were you with your wording and with what you said to them and how you said it to them? Um, and why, why is that important to do? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And you know, the way I see coaching is, I don't know what, where my kids are coming from before they get to programming, right? They could have been at school. Well, I know they're coming to school, but I don't know what their experiences have been be it at school, be it on the way to the gym, be it at home. And my hope is that the one hour, two hours that that young person is with me, that they walk away feeling like someone cares about me. If they haven't felt that all day, they know that someone cares about them. And so um, that has always been my approach to, to coaching. And one of the reasons why it's so dear to me is because just, again, going back to my experience as a young person, like I, I grew up in a predominantly um, white, <laughs> town in upstate New York, moving from Nigeria straight to upstate New York. You can imagine how different that, that must have been. And so um, I, I had a lot of negative experiences that were not intentional. Um, it was, again, ignorance or cultural differences or whatever you want to call it. But having those experiences always reminded me that should I ever coach in the future? Like I didn't really want to get into coaching until much later in my, when I was in grad school. But I always kept that in the back of my mind and make, making sure that the young people who I come up in contact with, especially people who look like me, who are brown, tall, awkward girls and skinny and 
of probably hearing all sorts of things throughout their day, right? Um, to, to help them feel empowered, help them know that there is a, a space for them in this world and they should occupy space, um, whether you're the loudest person in the room or you're the most reserved uh, person in the room. And I, I believe that sports can be a catalyst for that. Um, I've seen so many young girls that I've coached um, in the past just start to find their voices um, through sports um, or just find their voices in general because of women role models that they were exposed to. You know, last night I checked out a, a panel where one of the young girls who I coached many, many years ago, probably when I was an Up To Us coach, she was on, on a panel uh, speaking about um, female genital uh, mutilation, FGM, and um, how that, why that practice should be ended in many parts of Africa where it's still happening. And so hearing someone like her, who I knew when she was going through finding her voice and feel more confident and getting comfortable with public speaking, to see her on a panel as a 21 year old senior in college speaking so comfortably and so, so like she was there and just occupied space. And it was so amazing to see that. And I can't say I take full credit for that, that, that sports is the reason behind that. But I know that her having relationships with maybe people like myself or other uh, female role models that she had met in her life definitely played a role. So as much as we can empower our young girls because every day social media, the media, the news, they're seeing a lot of things that tell them they're not good enough. And so, especially black and brown girls, um, as much as we can, whether it's in the gym or in a classroom or even on the street, you see a girl who's pretty, let's compliment her because um, they're probably not hearing that a lot. And it's important that they know that they're, they're worthy. And so that's, um, that's always been my approach to, to coaching. If I, could add to that, if I could add to that, I think that intentionality is so important because we need to specifically design sports for girls. I think inclusion is important, but we can't get and recruit more girls into sports if we don't have appropriate inspirational motivating female coaches, if we don't have spaces that are designed for them. For us, it's very important in our programs that if a girl doesn't want to play baseball, she wants to play softball. We have fields that are designed for softball. It's very important to us that if a girl doesn't want to play baseball, she wants to play softball. We specifically have uniforms that are designed for girls and they're not putting on boys' pants. Um, it's important to have curriculum that includes motivating words and factors that really um, bring more empathy into, into the, the work and into what we're doing for girls. I think the intentionality part of it is so important and not that we're not all also thriving for inclusion and making sure that it's, it, it's about equity and equality and we're all the same boys, girls, no matter what it is, but I think that, or who it is, but I think that when it comes to intentionality, being very um, intentional about specifically designing a strategy for girls in sports um, is really important. I think it's really important to get girls into the game, to keep girls into the game, and to, to um, steer their success for sure. It's empowering. I agree, I agree. Neka, what's, what's next for you? What's your intentions after you finish playing? The playing doesn't last forever, unfortunately. Our bodies tell us it's time to, it's time to put it down. Um, but for you, what's, what's your intention? Um, I think all of us here have, we, we're, I think we seem to be very clear about what our intentions are, um, especially when it comes to girls and when it comes to our own lives and how we're moving forward. So what's next for you, Neko? What's the intention? Uh, you know, I, I actually don't necessarily have um, the exact job title of what I want to do, but I do know what I want to do is going to be leadership in sport. And it's, um, it's interesting because my dad, I was having a conversation with him and he was talking to me about, oh, you know, like maybe you can go and try and be the president of the Houston Rockets and such. And I said, I told him, I said, you know, they don't, they don't need me. It's fine. And he was like, no, I mean, like, I feel as though like you're kind of coming into your role because I told him that I still wanted to be engaged in sport, but also kind of lead collaboratively. Um, obviously in sports organizations. And I didn't say no because I didn't want it. I told him no because I have actually zero interest in engaging on the men's side. Mm -hmm. um, I feel as though everyone has their own path. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, I don't see how much more beneficial it would be to enhance their side mm -hmm. than it would be to 
obviously give back to what why I'm here you know um I don't I don't think it's right or it makes sense to walk through the doors others open for me only to close it and go somewhere else mm -hmm. and I want to make that known to young women who are aspiring to do anything um I think it's imperative for us to give back and to engage in the communities that we leaned on that empowered us to to have the positions that we're in now it's interesting i'm not trying to make this political at all but i was talking to my sister about it this morning and you know we have the supreme court justice hearings happening and it's so interesting how people are talking about the personal views of someone who is undergoing these hearings and she wouldn't even be sitting in that chair if it weren't for rbg only for her to now close the same doors that RBG opened for her to even be able to be in this position. And so I just find that, I don't think that makes sense at all. And it's not to say that everyone should do what I'm doing, but that's just my own personal volition. Um, I, I think it's as important as what Sally was talking about and also um, Nicole, when it comes to creating environments in which not just girls who want to be in sport can thrive, but women who want to coach them as well. You know, I, it's in the WNBA, I believe that there's only two female head coaches, none of which are black. And that's a problem. We want to see the advancement of um, us as people. And we're not doing that through representation and through being women of our word, being people of our word and understanding exactly what that means. That means combing through everything top to bottom, not just what you're seeing out there, whether it's in the C-suite, whether it's even behind the camera and having someone who's creating content that knows how to capture black skin. And that takes, it takes us to know us and we can't be making those types of decisions about us without us. And so um, that's a long-winded answer of saying that I, <laughs> I see myself involved in women's sports through leadership and empowerment, be it whatever title it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So then, okay, so, man, on that. Right. <laughs> hey, so man. Then, so <laughs> let's let's do this then because i think this is important and and it may not um this conversation may not result in you having that light bulb moment and knowing exactly what you're going to do but we have somebody like alicia who started a business who and i know what that's like where you get to a point where you're tired of doing it the way someone else wants you to do it and you say you know what i'm just going to do my own thing i'm going to start my own thing. So Alicia, walk us through this. You started a business for someone like NECA, for someone like young girls who say, I don't want to do it their way. I don't want to buy into what they got going on. I want to do something different and I want to do it the way I want to do it. Give us a blueprint. How do girls do that? How do they do that? Yeah, and you know what, I think it's really important for the girls who are on the call who might be into sports but not, may not be that good it's okay. You can still be in the sports industry without being good at sports. I tried them all. I tried soccer. I tried basketball. I tried tennis. And I was horrible. I was, they had A teams and B teams. They had me underneath the A and B teams. I was a C team. And it would just be like me and one other person. <laughs> and that was every sport I tried. Um, and when I was 10, I played basketball. I made two points the whole season. But I never gave up on sports. I just realized that the path wasn't for me to play sports. Like I um, was still able to be in the sports industry and work very closely in sports without me being the one doing it. Uh, so I thought that was just really important to say because there might be girls who are on the call Absolutely. who are into sports but just may not be that. So they don't give up on sports. Um, you just may not, you know, be able to go to the higher higher levels. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, in think, terms but here, and I want to add this before you go on, Alicia. I want to add this as well. There are also girls who may be good at sports but also think that I'm good, but I'm not NECA good. I'm good, but I'm not, you know, D1 good. Um, and think that because I'm not that, then I need to stop. That there's no future in this for me. 
that I'm never going to play in the WNBA or, you know, I'm never going to do these types of things. So I'm going to stop doing it mm -hmm. um, because I don't see the future. So I think it's really, really important. I appreciate you saying that because every woman that's in the sports industry, that's working in the sports industry, yes, a large number were athletes, but not everybody was an athlete. And if you look at the sports industry as a whole, and you look at the number of men who are in the sports industry, most of them never played a sport. Right. So it's not a requirement. It's not a requirement. And so I appreciate you sharing that. So I'm gonna shut up and go let you go on. Please give us the blueprint. No, I'm glad you said that too, because um, <laughs> it just really is important for women to realize, for young girls to see that, you know, you, you may be good. You may not be like me. You may actually be good at sports, um, but there you do have a future in sports. There needs to be more women in the sports industry, period, on the male side and on the female side. Women, there need to be women executives. There need to be women in the front office. Um, like they were saying, more women coaches. Um, but if you actually are good, you know, <laughs> you keep going. Um, and if you're not good, there's hope for you as well. Um, but just in terms of starting, uh, it was really important for my co-founder and I, we both were in a, a similar position. Uh, we had, I had been out of law school for about seven years. She had received her MBA focusing on sports and had been out for uh, quite a few years as well. We knew that we would not be able to get an entry position entry level position job in the sports industry. Uh, we also knew we wouldn't be able to make a lateral move because we had been out of our graduate programs for so long. So we knew that if we wanted to be in the sports industry, which we were passionate about, we would have to do it ourselves. Uh, so in terms of the blueprint, that was our, the impetus for us starting our company. Uh, we took the, our two passions, giving back and philanthropy and combined it with sports and the sports industry. And that's how we were able to come up with our company. Um, so for us, it was really important. There was a quote uh, if you, from Shirley Chisholm, if you d they don't give you a seat at the table, you bring a folding chair. For mm -hmm. us, we knew it was more than a seat at a table, that we would have to actually build the table to have a seat at the table. Um, and that's what we've been doing. We've been doing it our way. Um, you know, if you don't know exactly what you want to do, just put it together. We hadn't really heard of sport philanthropy. Uh, before we came up with the company there. We did some more research, we, we learned more about it, but we just knew that what we were passionate about and we said, let's just make it work. Let's figure out how to put it together and do what it is that we want to do. Awesome. If I could also add, sorry, just Absolutely. to the previous point, um, something that I also get a lot too is like when people meet me in person or have an opportunity to engage, they always say, Oh, you're in the WNBA. Well, I only played in high school. That's still a sport. Like, that still counts. Bitty ball, that still counts too. Yeah. Like, I think that people need to disregard the level at which they play because we all learn lessons at every level. And it's very important to realize that. And I try to impart that on young women, um, especially because even if you don't end up in the sports industry, most people who have experience on teams are way more likely to get a job than someone who hasn't. That's um, and so I think it's important for a lot of young women to understand that because at the end of the day, yeah, I'm in the WNBA mm -hmm. going on 10 years now, but I also realized that playing basketball got me a free ride to Stanford University. You know, there's certain doors that sports can open that aren't necessarily the path towards being, you know, a Sue Bird or a Cheryl Swoops, you know, it's just at the end of the day, if basketball is not there, I got a Stanford diploma. And, you know, and that's just something that I realized as I started playing sports, no matter what level I ended up at, there were so many opportunities, whether it was internships, jobs, or just being able to meet somebody because you play a sport. I think it's also very important for young women to understand that it doesn't matter if you're a professional. If you play, you already have an advantage and the acumen to really develop yourself later on. I want to ask a question that was um, that's been put in the chat for you guys. Again, we're we're asking girls to to chime in here and ask our panelists questions. So here's a question for you all, and this is open to all of you. How often do you feel the presence of inequities as it relates to pay disparity in the workplace? And how often do you courageously ask for your worth without being perceived as an unhappy 
for ungrateful black woman. That's heavy. <laughs> That's heavy. <laughs> That's heavy. You weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> That's heavy. Yes. So take, take a minute, take a minute, because that's a, that's a deep one. Um, and whoever wants to jump in and, and tackle that one, go ahead. I, can I just say, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you and say I'm still working on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that sounds, I've only had to negotiate one time. I've been here for 15 years. So let me say that at 31, when I took this job, I had no idea what I was doing or, or how I should negotiate. Um, I didn't have the network of someone to call because I didn't know. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm still working on that. Let me, let me just be honest. I, I'm still working in that area. I, I think it's definitely an, a room, an area where I can grow. Um, I have some people in my network now who are helping me grow in that space and i think that's a point to just young women like you you'll always need a network you always need a mentor or your personal kind of board of directors or people who are there um right now that may be like your coach it may be parents um maybe it's a big sister or, or someone in one of the organizations you're a part of you know that are helping to shape you but um i'm just gonna be honest i'm working on that y'all yeah yeah, no, absolutely. I would chime in and say I think that um, pay inequity absolutely still exists, and obviously yeah. I, I, I believe it strongly exists, especially for the, the few women that are in the front office, front offices of professional sports teams. I think that it's often what we don't know, so yeah. we're not able to even yeah. combat it or figure it out, and we might be um, – just really offensive about it because we're trying to figure out, well, I, I pretty much know I'm not there or she's not there or we're not here, but where is there? How does that yeah. defined? And I do believe that that is why having mentors and network outside of those that look like us, black women um, or women is super important. And I feel like I'm, I'm gaining the unknown and have gained the unknown by having allies who don't look like me and who, who don't have shared experiences, who've been able to clue me into some of what I don't know, which I think helps me then fight for what I want. So I think there's a confidence in the pay equity part where we have to not believe. Um, I think in the question she said um, that we are, you know, gonna be perceived as angry black women. So don't speak up, don't ask, be okay with what you want. I mean, with what you get, but we shouldn't settle. There is no settling, right? If you believe there is an inequity, you need to speak up. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to use our voice. You cannot be fired for speaking up. You cannot be, you know, there are protections that exist and we need to understand that when we're talking about pay inequity. Um, it's not about being rude or disrespectful or crossing certain lines, but um, if we can follow a certain structure and make sure we know the unknowns and yeah. then lift our voice up, you know, in a, in a politically correct way. I, I mean, I just believe like we, we have to keep pushing, but I do believe there's a far way to go. I agree. Totally. Nekka, you've been, a, you've been, as your position in leadership in the WNBA, you've had to be a part of those negotiations, right? For women. What does that look like? Cause some people don't know, like, you know, like Dr. Barnes said, she's had to negotiate her salary one time a lot of women don't know that you can, <laughs> you know what I mean? No. Or what that process is for negotiation. So from your perspective and what you've done with the WNBA, what does negotiation look like? How does that even happen? How do you come to the table and say, here's my position? Uh, man, I, I got to tell you, this was definitely a learning experience. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially because I was in the league when we had negotiated our last CBA and that did not feel like in a negotiation. I tell people this all the time. It felt like divorce court. It was, it was unbearable. It was confusing. Um, and I was only like two years into the league. So I was just kind of like, is this what I signed up for? And I was like, I just didn't understand what was happening. Um, fast forward to this uh, past CBA it wasn't by any means any easier, but um, I think what really helped us was that we 
we had we already known ourselves, but we were truly discovering our identity, which was our voice um, as athletes. And you know, the question was, do you experience pay inequity every day when I'm when I'm playing, when I'm scrolling on Instagram, when there's comments? I mean, it's there all the time. It's it's basically a part of women's sports at this point. Um, and it's not to say that I don't think anything of it, but I just understand the bigger picture and I understand what is more constructive to do at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, the CBA, it could not have happened without honestly hearing the voices of every single player. That's what it came down to. Even negotiating this season, we had to listen to the concerns of every single player. And most recently, my experience with negotiating our worth was understanding the percentage of pay we were going to receive heading into the bubble. 100%. That was it. That was the only answer we got from the players. There was no going back. Um, that was what we went to the Board of Governors with. That's what we went to our, um, uh, with Kathy with and our commissioner. And, and that's, it was just plain and simple. It was terrifying, but we, we were linked in arms, so we didn't feel alone. Um, and we were speaking our worth and we came out with confidence of which, of course, was on the backs of so many women that came before us for us to even to be able to be in that position. And us constantly recognizing that is something that's very, very, very important. Um, when it comes to the inequities, you know, Nicole hit it on the head. It's all about what you don't know. Yep. And especially in the sports, especially in the sports world with women's sports, there's a lot of transparency lacking. Like we still don't even fully know um, our financials, you know? And so how can we negotiate the percentage of revenue that we get if we don't know how much we're actually getting? Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's kind of, that's just what it is. You know, it's, it's just kind of the name of the game right now. It's not to say that we think that that's where it's going to always be. By no means is that where it's always going to be. But understanding the unknowns, understanding that you have a right to ask what you don't know. And quite frankly, and I know this might be a little different, um, especially like in sports, but I don't see any, I don't see any detriment in asking another woman what she's getting. Because I think that the culture of that competitiveness and that one seat at the table being only for one woman is something that has to be dismantled. Because at the end of the day, we're all trying to be up here. It's not about, oh, I'm fighting for her. Because, you know, there's, all, that's, there's always been that culture of, oh, you know, like, yeah, we work together, but I'm coming for you. And I haven't seen that work up until now. And we realized that in the CBA, um, not even just in the CBA, but even as athletes, we have brands, you know, we have agents. And I asked around what people were getting. Um, based on not necessarily like numbers, but like, you know, like what amenities are they providing? What resources are they providing for you so that I can understand better what I'm not getting, you know? Yeah. And it's important for us to engage in a way that is obviously comfortable in a professional setting mm -hmm. um, to let other women know that, yeah, you are being shortchanged. And that connection contributes to that collectiveness and that unity and that solidarity that makes it even harder for those above us to say no. Because if it's one person, it's easy. But if, if, it, if it's 1,000 people, mm -hmm. try and explain why you're telling us no if it's happening to all of us, you know? So um, that's kind of my, that's been my experience. And I'm hoping that in my role as president, I've been able to kind of chip away at um, those walls that have, have been built to keep us out. Very good. Thank you.